Hmm. Man, economy, and state. Human action. Democracy, the god that... <gasps> Mamma mia! Oh boy, what's this? Ah, there's a Warhammer Total War dimension in need of closure. Scheduled for completion using only zombies, creating a world brimming with the mindless undead. This assignment must be from a socialist video essayist looking for more viewers. Jokes aside, God knows when this order came in, so I better take care of it now before it's too late. We're going to need to mind control the Vampire Count Lord for this mission, but the Von Karsteins come along with too much extra vampire baggage. When it comes to an army of pure zombie zest, only Helm and Gorse can raise to the occasion. By taking control of this master necromancer, we will be able to produce a mass of rotting flesh so impenetrable that even Kolek would drown in it. The first step towards a great replacement of all living entities with zombies is to secure a homeland from which hordes of corpses can be regularly arisen and scores of necromancers can be trained in the darkest of black arts. Noblar Country doesn't sound like a natural source of zombie Armageddon, but it is an easily defended crossroads between many major regions and will serve us just fine. As our nascent zombie brigade emerges from the haunted forest, our starting location, the first sign of resistance makes itself known as a legion of stinky squeaky men who dare to think that their hordes are more potent than our own simply because they're equipped with fancier warpstone weapons. Unfortunately for Rodenkind, our healing abilities outpace even the most frenzied Skaven attacks at this early level, and before long the bustling busyness of Skaven Undercities gives way to the chilling quiet of newly built undead crypts. This region of the map is truly the stinkiest, being subject to a contest between the plague-ridden Skaven, Nurgle-worshipping plague brewers, and the plague-spreading Helmen Gorst. I tire of this tactless trifecta of talentless tyrants, and with the scouring of Kugoth's filth from the dragon and Isles, we establish ourselves as the sole Sepsis Supreme. We have secured a starting point for our terraforming quest, but still have only converted about 1% of the world's population. We must not waste time in bursting the fetid floodgates and pouring into our next conquest if we are to deliver this dimension in a timely, quality manner. Nothing invokes a winter wonderland quite like the ice-cold chill of undeath. When vampiric corruption is ushering in a festive season of unlife outside, I like to cozy up by the hearth and enjoy some classic mobile gaming goodness. There's one game in particular I always come back to, be it for the intricate combat system, the champion collecting, or just the awesome designs. Raid Shadow Legends is upping the ante once again with the new Cursed City content, some of the most daunting challenges released yet, available after level 52. Leading your heroes on an expedition to the city of Centranos, you will fight through 100 stages across four unique districts, including double boss stages and a final fight against Amius the Lunar Archon, a boss who can change between two different forms, just like mythical champions. Choose your own path, strategy, and tactics to secure new artifacts, materials, and even a mythical champion. Each month, the city will reset, providing a new array of challenges and rewards. Bringing the holiday theme full circle, there's also the Raid Christmas Story event taking place in which you follow Sir Nicholas on some mini-game mayhem and earn both in-game and real-life prizes. Head to RaidXmas.Plarium.com. There are all kinds of events coinciding with Sir Nicholas, such as tournaments, boosts, and a Yuletide Titan event, all with exclusive in-game rewards. If you haven't started playing yet, then click my link in the description or scan my QR code to get insane bonuses exclusive to Praximus. You'll get two epic champions from the Sacred Order. The first is Lightsworn, a very strong epic champion whose kit allows you to keep a team alive with a defense buff and a revive on death skill. And the second is Juliana. Unlocked after reaching level 15, she is an epic champion and a boss killer. She's also an attack type warrior with the magic affinity and therefore very powerful against enemies with the spirit affinity. Once you're in and crushing your enemies, come find me under the name PraximusYT. Join my clan Praximites, P-R-X-I, after following my exclusive link and we'll be legends together. See you on the battlefield. I am compelled to confess that conquering Cathay as a foreign power is always a delight. It is a land of variety in both landscapes and species. Unfortunately, I have made stopping the Imperial Chinese army the pretense of far too many videos already, and alas, must avoid the temptation to once again wax eloquently the tale of their demise. One can imagine that the multitudinous hordes of peasants are no match for the combat prowess of the undead legions and rapidly undergo the zombie life cycle of human fertilizer resurrected. Cathayans, suspended in their hoity-toity balloons, are doomed to watch helplessly as we wash over their patties and parishes. 
powerless to slow the surging masses. As we shamble energetically from the Knobbly Gorge, cities and towns are quickly restructured from Lucky Star Golden Dragon to Halloween Town. The Dark Elves hop on their ships and set sail for greener pastures, and the frankly dim-witted brute Nakai gets turned into a stylish pair of boots. With Cathay in shambles, we dispatch a few of our newly recruited lords to finish off the unholy conversion. The Badlands region now separates us from our burgeoning, centrally planned economy from the rest of the world. Inhabited by the Chaos Dwarves, who have no compunctions about wreaking unprecedented havoc amongst our tidal waves of unlife, having solved Cathay's communist dilemma by replacing its entire populace with zombies who never have to eat, we aim to break out towards the Old World to spread our message of cold, dead eyes and silent, still hearts. The forges of the Chaos Dwarves put what the Skaven called industry to absolute shame, producing weapons of unprecedented destructive potential. As our agent Helming Gorst leads uncountable contingents of corpses streaming through the mountain passes, the Chaos Dwarves are ready and bring the full might of their artillery and gunnery to bear on us. Although their weapons have no difficulty returning the once dead back to the dead again, they simply cannot contend with the sheer number of undead armies bursting from Cathay. Zombies are extraordinarily cheap, and our empire is expansive, with no need to build anything other than economy buildings. Fielding limitless lords is trivially easy. Wherever one powerful Chaos army might have the firepower to blast apart our squadrons, we simply send three or four armies at once, and soon they are no more. With the industries of Jar Nagrund ground to a halt, replaced by only the occasional gravedigger and headstone engraver, we have established a hegemony to last for ages. If we were to stop now, it would be centuries before the taint of undeath could even begin to be peeled off the surface of this world. Alas, this assignment requires 100% of the world to be converted, so we cannot stop now. Across the world's edge mountains exists a great pretender. Great like audacious, not good. A vampire count and his fang girl fashion themselves to be the rightful rulers of the midnight aristocracy. But unfortunately for them, a far purer manifestation of putrid power has formed a blob mob in the east, and now our looming darkness casts its shadow westward. The vampire aristocracy prefer to live like alternative teenagers, angsty and gothic, with a resistance to sunlight and fear of losing Wi-Fi, they yearn for endless night. However, their decadent lifestyles make them slow to detect what other nations in the region were quick to recognize, and they are not prepared for what is coming over the mountains. At first, it might seem like our army of mumbling sleepwalkers is sure to be outmatched by the von Karstein forces on account of the fact that they too have zombies, but also a great many additional types of infantry, each bringing another specialty which we lack. However, what really makes the difference is that in Warhammer Total War, each unit can only be healed so much during battle. After a certain point, their health can no longer go any direction but down. Thanks to a skill in Helmingorst's arsenal named Uncanny Resilience, our zombies' health points are increased by 25%, and their maximum healing is increased by 500% across the entire faction. Just to push the numbers that little bit further, Helmand gets an extra 50% battle healing limit increase on top of the faction-wide 500%, creating the healthiest band of deadbeats in the morgue. Not only do we wash over these foolish ghouls in short order, but we spill into Kislev and the Empire in the same fell stroke, so unstoppable is our inertia. Batteries of rockets and bare cavalry charges dismember and disperse crowds of bone bags, but no living army possesses the ammunition stockpiles or the sheer mass required to break our unbreakable hordes. With nothing but Altdorf remaining, we array legions unprecedented to assail the Emperor's desperate last redoubt. Although the Imperial artillery prohibits us from massing into a single, disgustingly dense blob, it does nothing to stop us from attacking with ten armies simultaneously. We take advantage of the trees and move towards their terrified armies, knowing that even if they wipe out the entire first three armies, seven more are already queued up to take their place. Although at this point it is clear that our dominance is indisputable, we must finish what we've started and begin our preparations to invade Araby, the Southlands, and Lustria. Yes, I'm including you in we, you enabler you. We might as well lump in the Antarctic in there as well while we're at it. The desert is a perfectly hospitable place for the undead, as evidenced by the presence of the Tomb Kings and other vampire count wannabes. 
For us, having conquered all that lay north and east of these lands, there is little concern that our massed armies will have difficulty annihilating all that lay before us here. Ancient skeletons crumble to dust trying to slow the advancing horde, and rogue vampires and greenskins flee for their lives, exhausted and terrified after spending hours hacking at our armies without making so much as a dent in our numbers. I hope it goes without saying by now, but I consider Hellman to be one of the easiest campaigns. His armies are heinously inexpensive, and his economy is laughably simple. His faction-wide buff to zombies allows each lord to participate in the zombie mobbing, and the ability to raise the dead means that armies can be raised quickly and responsively to incursions. Although I have shortened many tens of hours of campaigning in this relatively short video, most of the time it takes to run through this campaign is due only to the finite amount of movement possible each turn, delaying our invincible expansion. A typical sentiment of the undead is that for every one you kill, it seems like two more take their place. This is not the case for Gorse Schools, you simply can't kill them at all. I wouldn't be surprised if we could tank a Doom Rocket. The noose tightens around the Southlands as our forces sally out from the Border Princes and Nagashazar, scouring the eastern coastline and reaving the treasures of the ancient sands from those who possess them, both living and dead. The old world and all that it touches has fallen now to the darkness we were bidden to bring to this reality, and we can feel the world begin to slow as it nears the fulfillment of its purpose. As our trusted lieutenants Sirio and Arissa Case head back to preserve our deathly grip on conquered lands, now we look west across the sea and plan the final work to complete our mission. The final objective, shining brightly in defiance of our improved and compelling way of life, or I mean unlife. The glittery islands of the High Elves still festering with the presence of feminist Alariel's petty politicking. Not wanting to leave any corner of the earth left for them to flee to, we will first conquer Negarond and then what remains of the Far North. Dark Elves inhabit a land which I believe is based on Quebec and spray arrows into our unprotected scalps from within the Taiga Forest. Unfortunately for them, our flesh mobs are far beyond mere mortal weapons and our zombies make fantastic pincushions. Dark Elven resistance crumbles as the defenders and their monsters are chased into the woods and consumed by the undead masses. Norskin Lord Wolfric was too busy playing Pokemon Go to realize that we had conquered the entire planet and is absolutely furious. We've stolen all his legendary Lord kills and left him completely purposeless. Like a hollow undead, Wolfric charges headlong into our zombie masses and demonstrates that he is indeed the best duelist in the land. Unfortunately for Wolfric, it isn't enough to defeat one or two zombies, he and his forces must defeat tens of thousands. Before he is even 5% of the way through the first of our endless armies, he falls to the ground exhausted and gets trampled by our absent-minded foot soldiers. Not one living soul remains from the Jade River Delta to the Iron Sand Desert except in Ulthuan. Crushing the High Elves doesn't take very long, as you can expect. In Warhammer Total War, it is not especially difficult to reach a stage in the game in which you are simply beyond the power levels of those who remain to resist you, but we have to conquer every last settlement to complete this commission, and that's exactly what makes us the best in interdimensional commissioning. Alariel and her Treekin army brazenly defy destiny at the Gaian Vale. Her arboreal allies present a steadfast defensive perimeter while the expert rangers of Avalorn dish out damage from afar. Unfortunately, they do not know that their dimension has been marked for death, and their resistance is in vain. The tireless masses swarm the defenders with reckless savagery, tearing away their bark with gnawing teeth. Each deadly salvo claims another ephemeral victory as a swath of zombies fall, but with so many potential targets, it does not take long for their quivers to run dry. And when the elves reach for their final arrow, realizing they had spent all that they had, it is clear that there are more undead on the field than when the battle even began. In the end, there are no survivors, and so this version of the Warhammer Total War world completes its proper course and begins to wind down. Don't forget to check out our official Praximus Raid clan and capitalize on all the exclusive benefits available via my link. See you on the battlefield with the rest of the Praximites clan. How satisfying. Another reality comes into existence full of purpose and is able to see that purpose through to its proper end. I know what you're thinking. What kind of purpose is a zombie apocalypse? But it's not for me to judge these things. Not a moment too soon either, it seems, but before we get interrupted, I'd like to take a moment to thank everyone for your continued support. 
Your viewership makes my work possible. In particular, I'd like to thank my patrons who directly contribute to our valuable mission. In the members category, we have Ark Monarch, Dan Campbell, Eric B. Elasic, Fibers, Quake Riley, Shadow Singer, Space Drake, and Toxic Mask. In the helpers category, we have Maxwell Hopkins, Rogue VR, Rolo123, Salvalis, and Thorkel the Tall.